This is the Light of Truth radio broadcast with Michael Boldea. Sorry, everybody. Uh, this this has been an interesting uh, turn of events, as it were. I've been speaking into the ether for the better part of 18 minutes, and apparently nobody's heard a word I said. Um, welcome to the Light of Truth radio broadcast. For those of you that have been online for 18 minutes and have been listening to Static, my apologies. It was not intended. I hope you can hear me well. I'm doing this off of my cell phone uh, because apparently the setup doesn't seem to be working at this moment in time. Uh, It's finicky, I guess. Um, Or the enemy is trying to keep us from doing what we do, uh, and I would hazard to guess that it's probably the second thing because the devil is not happy with the truth. Uh, and here we are. We we shine the light of truth on the lies of the enemy. We li- shine the light of truth on the lies of men. And uh, we attempt to make our way through this dying world towards life eternal. So whenever the enemy discovers that someone is speaking the truth, he does his utmost uh, to keep that truth from getting out. And I think this was one of those cases. Uh, I am your humble host, Michael Boldia, a.k.a. the Angry Christian. Uh, and I thank you wholeheartedly for taking the time and joining us. Um, I'm hoping that if you're listening after the fact, Gino will cut out the first 18 minutes of static. But we will converse about this at the end of the program, whether live or recorded. Uh, it's still a nice chunk of time out of your life. And so I'm humbled that you chose to use this time to listen to this broadcast. All right, it's working. Gino brought me a cable, although I have no clue where to plug it in, but that's okay. See, we're making it work. This is, this is, this is what men who use reason and wisdom do. They make it work. So uh, why did I just call myself the angry Christian earlier? Uh, I got an email. Uh, from what I can only assume uh, is a pampered, safe space, trigger warning, brain full of mush sort of college student uh, who said that they listened to one of my YouTube rants and I sounded like the angriest Christian ever. Uh, Well, I I prefer to call it passionate. uh, And no, there's nothing wrong with passion. Since when has being a Christian become synonymous with being some monotone, robotic-sounding rube who allows for not a trace of passion in anything they say or do. But seriously, how can you not be passionate when we're living in a world of suspended disbelief? How can you not be passionate when fools and perverts are willfully endangering your family? How can you not be passionate when the only class of citizen you can still mock and marginalize and persecute and ridicule and make fun of and ostracize is the Christian. I'm sorry, but being a Christian doesn't mean you have to be everyone else's doormat. I'm sorry, but being a Christian does not mean that you have to just sit in the corner and take your lumps and wait for the Jesus bus to come. I will not simply go along with the meme that all Christians are knuckle draggers, that all of us have have room temperature IQs and that there's not a full set of teeth between a 30-member church. I, for one, will not stand for being degraded by perverts and pederasts. I will not stand for being degraded by drug addicts and alcoholics pretending to be enlightened world scholars. It's not a pride thing. It's a right and wrong thing. It's a true and false thing. As believers, as Christians, we represent Christ. And to allow the world to think that all of Christ's representatives are a bunch of Neanderthal deaf mutes just won't cut it for me. 
Again, don't confuse anger with passion. Sometimes they are interchangeable, but most of the time they're not. Now, as has been the custom since the genesis of this program, this week's broadcast promises to be a very thought-provoking, interesting, and even challenging hour or now, what, 37 minutes of uh, non-terrestrial radio, having Jesus as both its foundation and its undergirding. Now, without Jesus as our focus, without Jesus as our final destination, without Jesus as that towards which we gravitate, we are no better off than the world. We are lost. We are, we are rudderless. We're hopeless. We're fearful. And I, for one, cannot fathom that a believer, a follower of Christ, ought to be as fearful and rudderless as someone that is living in darkness. As I said, we have a lot of ground to cover. We have a lot of things to get to, but perhaps the most noteworthy thing to take place this past week is, is an undeniable awakening of sorts. Throughout the world, people are waking up to the fallacy of globalism. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do believe there, there are powerful men in powerful positions whose desire is globalism. It's no longer a theory when it becomes factual. And this is the one thing that we need to understand. It it is a fact now. Globalism is being pushed on us. And people are waking up to the reality that, hey, it's not something we really want. Look, I come from a nation that really doesn't have a lot to boast about. We're, we're, we're best known for Vlad the Impaler and Nadia Komenich. So basically, we're best known for the guy after whom the novel Dracula was written and a girl who got a perfect 10 in the Olympics. But you know what? Teaching my daughter our, our customs and traditions... I'm going to be teaching my daughter the history of our nation, even though it's not stellar, even though we were with the Germans before we were with the Russians, before we were with the Americans. All all the boils and all the warts, everything is the history of the nation. And, And all of that, for better or worse, made the nation what it is today. See, nationalism has become a dirty word, and it shouldn't be we're actually seeing average citizens, we're seeing men and women who would otherwise have continued to keep their heads in the sand and not give much attention to what is happening, take umbrage at the notion that nationalism ought to die a slow and painful death and that the only way to survive is globalism. It's stunning to me that this is what it took for people to wake. People are waking up nevertheless. Now, we'll get a bit more into this topic, Lord willing, because it's, it's eye-opening as far as pinpointing where we are vis-a-vis the end times. But another topic that, that's making headlines, uh, and one, again, that is noteworthy, is that there's actually pushback to this whole, you're allowed an opinion as long as you don't disagree with our agenda crowd. There's actually pushback. They've actually gone one step too far. They stretched it until it broke. And now people are going, all right, enough of this. The nation is beginning to realize that those who demand tolerance are not so tolerant themselves. And all this claptrap about getting along was viable only until they seized the reins of power. Now that power is theirs, they simply impose their will, they simply impose their agenda, their descent into degradation and lawlessness. Look, I've said this before and I will say it again. The darkness will not be nearly as docile. The darkness will not be nearly as understanding or kind or tolerant of you as you have been of it. 
the darkness will not tolerate you as long as there is light in you. And at every turn, at every opportunity, the darkness will attempt to either kill off the light in you or do away with you altogether. No, I'm not being an alarmist. I'm not attempting to instigate anything. I'm just telling you what the reality of the situation is so that you might spiritually, so that you might know what is around the bend and not be caught unaware or by surprise. It's astounding to me how many Christians believe that the devil will be kind and understanding as long as they remain quiet and don't upturn the apple cart. They look upon those who would stand for truth and those who would stand for principle and those who would stand for honor and for righteousness as as, as some grenade-throwing outcasts who should be silenced for the good of society as a whole. Look, I've been called every name under the sun. And oddly enough, not by those of the world, but by many within the household of faith. Why? Because I will not toe the line of any particular denomination. Because I will not run interference for any man. And because, I guess, I'll tell you the truth about the seedy underbelly of what many call ministry, but what is really an ego-stroking with a helping of extra income. That's the best way I can put it. So, as we usually do, even though we've been delayed a little, uh, we will be answering your questions, uh, since there are a handful that have been forwarded to me. And as time permits, we will delve into the topic of deception in the church and why it is such a dangerous thing. Now, we're going to start with a few questions, uh, then hopefully get into some headlines from Sodom if there's still time. I doubt there is because we're already 30 minutes in. Uh, But we will finish off the program with the aforementioned discussion on why deception in the church is so dangerous. Uh, And so on to our first question, and it says this, Dear Sir, the scriptures in Matthew 28, 19, where Christ commanded his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He was speaking to his disciples at this time. The disciples knew who Christ was and that he was the Father manifested in the flesh as seen of angels and received up into glory. The disciples never questions, never questioned what he commanded, and Peter was given the understanding And when he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, he was speaking what Christ commanded him because he knew what the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit was. So why do so many churches shun saying the name of Jesus when they baptize but prefer to say the titles of his name? For I am a daughter and a mother, but my name is Jeanette. So what is the right way to baptize? All right, if I can assume that your name is Jeanette, then Jeanette, I think that you've answered your own question. Whether baptizing in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both are biblical and biblically sound. Now, I personally baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit because Jesus commanded it to be thus. But since people were baptized in the name of Jesus in the Bible as well, it is not wrong to do it. Now, what I do take issue with is people getting baptized again and again, whether one way or the other, just to cover their basis. I've met people that that were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then they went and they got baptized again in the name of Jesus. Then they went and got baptized again because another ritualistic person told them they needed to do it that way. And, and it just gets out of hand. Look, before we're baptized, we must confess that Jesus is Lord and that we are committed to him. Water baptism is the outward expression of an already completed inner work. 
So whether you were baptized in the name of Jesus or baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one does not make you more righteous than the other. And with that, I hope I've answered your question. It's that simple. Both are biblical. And and those that insist it must be done one way rather than the other need to read their whole Bibles. On to our next question, which comes from Brother Bruce. And it says as follows. Caught your program on YouTube the other day, and you were talking about tent making. Can you explain that, please? Wouldn't it be wiser to use the time doing ministry? I guess I'm trying to understand because I want to go into full-time ministry eventually, and you kind of made me wonder if it was okay to think this way. <laughs> All right, Brother Bruce, my answer. Uh, my answer. What, look, when it comes to this topic, I can only speak for myself. I like to make this distinction whenever possible. There is personal conviction and there's general doctrine. And so when it comes to this topic, I can only speak for myself. As far as I am concerned, as far as my person is concerned, I do not want to be dependent on ministry for my daily bread because dependency makes a man vulnerable to pressures. Does that make sense? Dependency makes a man vulnerable to pressures. Now, if, like Paul, I was a tent maker and I needed more money, I would just make more tents. If ministry, however, was my only source of income, then I would have three choices whereby I could feasibly make more money. First, I could pray for God to provide more money. We've all seen the wonderful sort of 30-minute infomercials about money coming to us now, and if only we would order the green prosperity handkerchief, uh, money would flow from every pipe in our home. Uh, and look, although I do believe in the power of prayer, I do believe that God answers prayer, I also believe that God will not do for you what you can do for yourself. I know that's not very popular because we all want a nanny state and we want a nanny God. But God is not a nanny God. He will help you when you can no longer help yourself. He will do those things that you cannot do so that you can rightfully identify his presence and his hand. So first, again, I could pray for God to provide more money. The second thing I could do is go out and get a job. But I'm sorry to say my time is worth more than $7 an hour or even $15 an hour to me. And working for someone else is not something that I look forward to with great enthusiasm. Look, I've said it before. I know how to make money. I know how to do it in my time, on my time, and, and, and quite honestly, it's not that difficult a thing. And so the second thing that I could do is go get a job, but that falls by the wayside for me because, again, my time is worth more than 15 bucks an hour to me. Now, third, I could take it upon myself to, to steer the messages that I speak and steer the things that I write in such a way wherein the ministry gets larger and I can afford to pay myself more. Now, of the three, I see more ministers choosing the third option than the other two combined. And I see men that I knew when starting out in ministry, men that I knew spoke the truth unabashedly and unashamedly who are now nothing more than shills, who are now doing nothing more than parroting the talking points of the godless, trying to spiritualize their compromise and trying to get others to go along with their delusions. So, as I said, Brother Bruce, 
this is not gospel. I'm not making a new rule for pastors or preachers or evangelists or even radio show hosts. This is a personal conviction. This is a personal choice. And I believe it helps keep the messages that I deliver pure and unadulterated. Now, as far as using the time for ministry, look, let's face it. You can only write for so long. You can't write nonstop and you can't preach nonstop and you can't pray nonstop. I can meditate on the word while doing what I do to supplement my income. And and since I work for myself, if the need arises, I can stop. I can write down an idea. I can write down a few articles. I can write down a message or whatever else and then return to what I was doing when I when I finish. And so I'm usually in the office around 5 in the morning. Uh, I usually leave around 3 to take my daughter to the park or, or, or to her favorite children's place, except on Thursdays when I'm here from 5 in the morning till 7 in the evening because I'm doing this. I'm doing the radio program. So even using the world's 8 hours per day rule, I am not robbing God. I wake up earlier than most to do what I have to do in order to keep food on my family's table. And the Bible neither looks down upon this, nor does it discourage it or condemn it. Take from that what you will, Brother Bruce. Uh, Look, again, I don't begrudge anyone being in full-time ministry, uh, but it just, it, it gets so tempting. It gets so tempting to twist the message just a little bit so that your ministry grows a lot faster. Look, I know what I'm capable of. I know this sounds conceited and haughty. Believe me, it's not. I I just, I know my aptitudes. I know what I'm capable of. I hear the messages preached by men who have the biggest churches in the world And as conceited as it may sound, I know I can do a lot better. I can come up with a better story. I can come up with better delivery. The reason I choose not to is because I fear God. And so if ministry were the only thing that provided for my family, it, I, I honestly, it would be a, an extra temptation to, to life that I don't want to deal with. I don't want to be constantly tempted to twist the message to grow the ministry just a little more so I can get a little more pay. I would rather work. I would rather build my own version of Kent's and not be wholly dependent on it. So, again, Bruce, take from it what you will. Our next question comes from Brother Douglas, and I don't know if this is our Brother Douglas, Uh, But regardless, this is the question. Dear Brother Michael Boldia, I think it is Brother Douglas because he used both my names. So, hello again, Brother Douglas. Uh, Dear Brother Michael Boldia, I was up until 1 a.m. Tuesday night, angry and grieved in my spirit over this transgender bathroom issue. Uh, By the way, have you been seeing the news reports uh, of, of perverted men taking advantage of this? one after the other being exposed, taking pictures in women's bathrooms and, and, and a bunch of other things. See, th- this, is, this is what happens when you have a myopic view. This is, this is what happens when you decide to go along with an agenda not taken into a collateral damage that it will have. Now, it says, I'm a new Christian, but I believe God is leading me. I have decided along with my wife to boycott Target but I don't feel that is enough. I am praying about what other actions to take. Would it be feasible to protest outside of Target? Thank you for always answering my questions. It is Brother Douglas. God bless you, Brother Douglas. Because if, yes, thank you for always answering my questions. I have asked a couple of brothers to pray and fast and stand with me. Please pray for us. God bless you, Douglas. Honestly, Brother Douglas, Target is just one of many. Uh, and I think simply boycotting them and, and no longer giving them your money 
will do more in the long run than you realize. Look, before Target, there was, what, J.C. Penny that decided to spit in the eye of the average Christian. And they made their spokesperson a, a, a lesbian. And each quarter, their earnings have gotten worse and worse and worse, and eventually J.C. Penny will go out of business. Because if enough people decide they do not want to finance perversion, these places will be forced to shut down. Now, the last I checked, close to one million people. Think on that. One million people have signed a petition to boycott Target. And I guarantee you that for every one individual who signed, there are three, four, perhaps even five who have not signed it but who have chosen to no longer patronize them. The other thing that we can do is, is pray and pray with zeal so that the hearts of more and more and more individuals are, are stirred to wakefulness so that they see the danger that they and their families are in and that they too will take action. Look, if the Lord leads you to pick a target, then do it. But once again, we must distinguish and differentiate between personal convictions and general doctrine. Some people God may call to do that. Others, he may call to something else. But the fact that you are awake, and many, many, many others are awake with you, is a hopeful, hopeful sign. Now, our next question comes from Don and Carol, and it says as follows. Ah. Dear Brother Mike, thanks so much for your current post. And in case you have no clue what you're talking about, I posted uh, basically a rant on my blog about what happened with Target and about other things. And uh, people have been writing in and, and, and commenting on that. And it says it has done... For us, uh, more than breaking your silence against the craziness, it lets us know that we are not alone in the stands that we are taking even within our own families. Soon and very soon we think that our very livelihood will be forfeited and more. We keep crying out for Jesus to wake up his church in America. It's for sure that they won't listen to our voice. We are ostracized and run out of the churches in this area as bigoted and narrow-minded, etc. So persecution must come to the church to purge and save some who will be forced to face the facts that about the false leaders that they've been listening to proclaiming tolerance. They don't even see the hypocrisy in the statement of these companies or churches when they say we are an inclusive company or church. One pastor, and this is in quotes, even told us that he would not abortion because he didn't want to risk someone sitting in the pew that had one and would be offended. Guess it never occurred to him that he could also preach repentance and forgiveness available in Jesus must have missed where it says that the gospel is an offense to the disobedient. Sure, they are inclusive, except for anything or anyone who is speaking truth in these insane days. Always the same list of pejoratives they use to condemn us and defend perversion. Your posts are just as important to encourage those of us who are feeling pretty lonely. So thank you. We were just talking last night about how we need to spiritually get prepared to give up our home, our job, and and like the instruction to Lot's wife, not to look back. So when our testing comes, we will be ready. We are just simple people trying to do what works Jesus would have us do. We fail all the time, but we know in whom we have believed and am confident He can take us through. In the the delivering power of Jesus Christ, Don and Carol. Well, thank you for those kind words. And uh, I think they echo the sentiment of a lot of people. 
we must stand. Because if we don't stand, who will? That's that's the question that, that we must answer for ourselves. If we do not stand, who will? So thank you for that. I, I, I think it encapsulates the sentiment of a lot of people, especially a lot of people that listen to this program. Uh, and our next question says this, question for Michael for a future broadcast. I heard a broadcast about how Japan is moving to a system of buying and selling via fingerprints and how we in the U.S. are getting used to swiping cards with chips and other devices, just short of a chip in the hand or the forehead. Michael, do you believe we Christians will be lulled into taking the mark of the beast because it will just be the next convenient step in buying and selling via our credit system? Or will God make it really, 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 yes, three really, 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 really clear to us that the Christ is demanding us to take the mark so we can clearly refuse to take it? I realize we should always pray for discernment, but do you think God will clearly show us the dividing line and true Christians will know that we are being asked to cross the line from God's will? That is a good question, and it. (laughs) <laughs> it dovetails really well into what I wanted to talk about tonight, but since we have only 10 minutes left, uh, I'll probably save it for next week, where hopefully everything will be working. Uh, but to answer your question uh, very succinctly, no, I do not believe that Christians will be able to be tricked into taking the mark of the beast. It will be something that they are fully aware of, It will be something that they will know what it is, and they will also know what it means. But see, we live in an age where far too many people love their lives more than they love God. And Jesus himself said, those who seek to save their life will lose it. And so men will reason to themselves, if I don't do this, my family will starve. If I don't do this, I will lose my job. I will lose my livelihood. Exactly what what Don and Carol wrote about in their letter. See, they're doing the wise thing. They're preparing for those days. We need to have that mindset wherein our lives are forfeit. Anything that we have belongs to God. He can take it away as easily as he can allow us to keep it. But there will be a lot of believers who will justify to themselves taking the mark of the beast, knowing full well what it is. A very large segment of believers will will convince themselves that it cannot be the mark of the beast because of the pre-tribulational doctrine that they hold to. Now, I realize this sounds confusing, and I'm going to get really deep into it in next week's program. If you know a pre-tribber, or are a pre-tribber, I love you, I hope you're right, but I know that you're wrong, and we're going to get into it biblically, and, and, and just flesh out why it's such a dangerous doctrine. Because a lot of believers will not believe that this is the mark of the beast, because in their minds they're not supposed to be here for the taking of the mark of the beast. Because they believe a fraudulent doctrine a doctrine that is not tethered, but is only, what, a couple hundred years old, their entire mentality, their entire mindset, the entire trajectory of what they will be doing in these times is skewed. And so they will feel comfortable with doing this, even though true believers will say, it's the mark. Well, no, it can't be. We're not supposed to be here for that. Didn't you know? Glory, glory, the bus is coming. And so it can't be the mark because we're not supposed to be here for the mark. They, 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 they catch 22 themselves into this justification of doing what the Word of God tells us we ought not to do. And then you have the other side of the coin wherein very well-respected preachers and teachers and evangelists and, and, and dare I say, Bible scholars are telling their followers and their listeners and their parishioners that 
even if they take the mark of the beast, it will do them no harm as far as their spiritual life is concerned because, well, one saved, always saved. And if that's the case, then it doesn't matter what you do. Again, we allow a doctrine to dictate whether or not we believe the word of God to be factual. There are men contradicting the word of God itself. And there are those defending them who, who will go to fisticuffs with you for it. And every time you point to the word of God, plainly written, plainly there, visible for all to see, they'll get angry, they'll shake their head and go, well, this man is much too respected to be a liar. He can't be wrong. Well, I'm sorry, one of them is. Either the word of God is wrong, or the men that are saying that taking the mark of the beast will not endanger you in any way, spiritually speaking, are wrong. And so it's one of those things that we will have to choose choose whom you will believe. Look, Second Timothy, I keep going back to this. In recent weeks, other than doing a series on uh, what it means to be a soldier of Christ is something that my brother Daniel talked me into, uh, it's called the Armory, and we have this men's meeting every month, once a week, and uh, we're, we're going through this, this entire teaching, and it's really opening up. I know I'm, I'm off topic, but it, it's getting really good, actually, uh, even if I do say so myself. Uh, and, and I'm teaching it every, every Saturday, every once, once a month every Saturday. Um, and, and other than that, I, I've been... In, in Timothy uh, and, and a few of the other scriptures that deal with the end times. In Second Timothy 4, uh, beginning with verse 3, it says, For the time will come. Now, Paul is writing 2,000 years ago of a future time, and he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine according to their own desires because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now, we need to look at this and, and defragment it and go at it piece by piece. And, and we're going to do that next week. I promise you, this is going to be the topic. Gino can already send out the email blast. This is going to be the topic. But it says, according to their own desires. Now, I will be honest with you. My flesh does not desire tribulation. My flesh does not desire hardship. My flesh does not desire the testing of my faith. But rather than heap up for myself, teachers, rather than bristle at sound doctrine, I get on my knees and I pray for the strength to endure. Now, other people have chosen to heap up for themselves, teachers, because they don't want to be strengthened. They want to be told that everything's going to be okay. They're being said fables. A fable is a fairy tale. It's what we tell our children before bedtime. Things about talking elephants and little boys who speak to panthers, those are fables. And Christians today are believing fables. They're believing fairy tales rather than the word of God. Why? because the fables are in line with their own desires. Their desire is not to glorify Christ, whether through their life or their death. Their desire is to go to heaven on a bed of roses, be welcomed into the kingdom of God, be put at the head of the table, and be applauded by the martyrs of old as well as the modern-day martyrs for having the strength of character to be a Christian in America. That's what they want. And they found 
the teachers to tell them exactly what they want. Again, my apologies for the delay. My apologies for the 20 minutes of apparently dead air. Uh, I got a good microphone. Apparently, it didn't work tonight. But we will pray and try to make it work next time, and we'll delve into this a little more. With that, Gino, it's yours. You've got about 15 seconds. God bless you, everyone, and thanks for your patience. All right, everyone, just send your questions to lightoftruth at handofhelp.com. God bless you. Have a great weekend. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast, The Light of Truth with Michael Baldea. If you would like to order a copy of today's broadcast, please visit our website at handofhelp.com. If you have questions about our ministry, you can email us at handofhelpoffice at aol.com or simply call us at 920-206-9910. God bless you. They are